Hello and welcome to the Cambridge University Herbarium. My name is Lauren Gardner and I'm the curator of the herbarium here. The herbarium is part of the Department of Plant Sciences and it is a collection of an estimated 1.1 million herbarium specimens collected over more than 300 years. The collection has developed over more than 300 years um, from the collections of different botanists who have worked here in Cambridge or been associated with Cambridge in some way. Uh, alumni have left us their collections. We've had various collections which have been purchased um, over the years and added to the herbarium. But in recent decades, the herbarium has not really been used very much and it's sort of fallen off the map a little bit. Um, one of the things that we are working to do now is to make the collection much more active and accessible for researchers, for students, for members of the public. So over the next few years, we're going to really work to make the collection much more accessible and uh, viewable by members of the public and researchers. The site where the herbarium is based is within the Botanic Gardens and it's within the Sainsbury Laboratory. It's not really a site that can be open for people to come in and out of. You don't really have an exhibition space, um, but by doing tours, by doing online activities and making our specimens available online, we should be able to make the collection much more open. So the herbarium was founded by John Martin, who was the second professor of botany in Cambridge in the 18th century. And he was succeeded by his son, Thomas Martin. Between the two of them, they accumulated a large herbarium, a hortus siccus, of dried pressed plants. And I'm gonna show you some of those specimens. It was really John Stevens Henslow though, who became the fourth professor of botany in Cambridge in 1825, who made the collection a much more scientific, modern teaching and research collection. John Stevens Henslow was also really the founder of the modern botanic garden here in Cambridge. And in a similar way, he laid the gardens and the herbarium out systematically according to the new theories of, of taxonomy and classification. And he really used specimens and living plants in his research. Henslow is really known today as being Charles Darwin's mentor. Uh, he was his tutor when Charles Darwin was a student here in Cambridge. And it was Henslow who got Darwin really interested in diversity and observing the variation in nature. It was also down to Henslow that Charles Darwin ended up on the voyage of the Beagle. Um, and we have Charles Darwin's botanical specimens here in the herbarium because Darwin sent those specimens back to his tutor, Henslow. Henslow distributed some of the specimens to places like Kew, uh, but the, the main collection stayed here in Cambridge and we have those specimens today. So now I'm going to take you into the herbarium. I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of the space and how the collection is arranged and the facilities we have here. I think I'm going to show you some specimens and show you our new digitisation studio. So before we actually go into the workrooms of the herbarium and the collection space itself, uh, we have a prep room. The prep room is where we can prepare specimens which have been made um, either in the field or they've been sent to us or they've been made in the garden. The specimens are dried and pressed and then they are all frozen in this big chest freezer. The specimens are frozen for at least three days at minus 30 degrees, minus 40 degrees. Um, and that will kill any pests which are on the specimens. This is our best defence against specimens getting eaten by various pests that, that will destroy the material ultimately. In the past, we were able to use a lot of different chemicals uh, to kill pests and to keep the pests away. Uh, obviously, now we can't use many of those chemicals. They're not particularly safe for humans. Um, and this is our most usual line of defence against pests. If we make specimens well, if we dry them, press them, we keep them dry and we keep the pests away, um, keep the temperature fairly stable and the humidity stable, specimens can last for hundreds of years. 
uh, particularly if they are not exposed to light. So you'll see when we look at the specimens, they are kept in folders, they are kept closed, and we, we open them up to study them, but we don't leave them out on display for long periods of time. So this is the herbarium collection itself. So this room, we are able to keep the temperature and the humidity between a range uh, that, that is good for storing specimens long term. Um, most of the collection is in compactor units and I'll take you down the centre of the room so you can see some of those but it's it's movable roller stacking which means we can have a lot of specimens within a, a smaller space than, than you would otherwise be able to. The specimens are laid out in geographic areas and also we have quite a few um, separate collections associated with particular individuals. So the Darwin specimens are kept separately, for instance, and Oliver Rackham's herbarium is kept separate uh, for various reasons. Around the outside uh, of this part of the, the room, we have um, these drawers, and these drawers are filled with packets. So the packets inside the drawers um, contain small specimens, um, and then on the outside we have the, the, the collection information for each specimen. This is obviously a much more compact way of storing smaller specimens. Uh, this is particularly used for bryophytes, so mosses, liverworts, hornworts, and also we have some lichens and we have some microfungi and other taxa in, in these collections. One of the most important sets of specimens we have here is our type collection. Now type specimens are the specimens that names are attached to. So when a plant is described, a specimen is designated as being the type specimen for that plant name. We know that the herbarium here in Cambridge is particularly rich in types. We have an estimated 50,000 type specimens out of our 1.1 million herbarium specimens. Some of them have been identified in the collection over the years by researchers and they've been pulled out and they've been put into these red folders. So here we have the red folders kept separately and these are all type specimens. So these are some of the most important ones that many researchers inquire about, want to see when they visit the collection. Um, these are our, our most important specimens really. However, this is the tip of the iceberg. This is not 50,000 specimens here. Most of the specimens, the type specimens, are within the main collection and they just haven't actually been identified as being types and designated. So when a researcher comes, studies a particular area of the main collection, they very, very commonly pull out new, newly designated type specimens or specimens which have not previously been recognised as types and put into these red folders. So now we'll walk down the centre of the, the main hall. So here on one side, most of, of this side up until this point is the uh, collection which is Great Britain and Ireland. And this herbarium is extremely comprehensive. It's one of the best collections for Great Britain and Ireland uh, herbarium specimens there is. Um, and it was laid out by Peter Sell and Gina Morell when they wrote their five volume flora of Great Britain and Ireland. This is a really comprehensive, rich collection of specimens. Down from this point to the end is the Flora Europea herbarium. And this was one of the herbaria which was used in the writing of the multi-volume Flora Europea. Um, that collection hasn't really received very much attention for quite some time um, and contains some very interesting things for sure. On the other side, all of the compactors along here are in the world herbarium. Now this collection again has not received very much attention or study in recent decades but this is the part of the collection that is very very rich particularly in undesignated type specimens and specimens from 19th century and early 20th century collectors. This is a really interesting collection for me as a tropical botanist, a particular interest in tropical botany 
Um, and this is the, the area of the collection where if you want to find type specimens, uh, researchers definitely want to start looking. So as I said, some of the collection is laid out in separate individuals collections. Um, and we have some of the collection of John Lindley separate here in there's two and a half sides of compactors uh, towards the end of the world collection. The rest of the Lindley collection is actually integrated into the main world collection. So, but within there, we have the majority of John Lindley's herbarium specimens. Now, John Lindley was uh, the secretary of what became the Royal Horticultural Society. He described thousands of new plants to Western science. Um, and particularly plants of horticultural interest. His specimens often have botanical artwork on them. There are many, many type specimens in there and this is a really rich and exciting area of the herbarium. So as with many herbaria, we do have a sizeable collection of material and specimens which have never really been researched at all. They are sometimes still in the original newspapers, they often don't have the, the labels of the information attached to them, but hopefully the information is with them or we can find it from other archive sources. Uh, but this is material which needs to be curated and integrated into the main herbarium. Now there are many boxes in this area um, and many of them have names of very interesting, very important botanists, parts of the world, periods of time. Uh, so again, this is a very interesting area for researchers in particular to come, historians to come and look and see what specimens we have. So this is the Herbarium's new digitisation studio. This is where we have a couple of Macintosh computers and cameras and light boxes and also a scanner set up. This equipment means that we can image our specimens, high resolution, very standardised, standardised lighting, uh, scale bars, colour charts, and we can make these images of the specimens, which we can then either deliver to researchers on request, um, but increasingly and ideally, we get the specimens available for anybody to access online. And so over the next couple of years, we will be really making this happen for the Cambridge University Herbarium, starting with particular discrete parts of the herbarium with particular research and stories to tell and based around the specimens. So we will be imaging our specimens and we will be making them available for anybody to access uh, and they will be on the Cambridge Digital Library platform. Uh, so watch this space because there's going to be a lot of progress in this area over the next year for sure. So I'm going to show you some specimens now and, and sort of tell some of the history of the collection as well as I go through. So inside the folders of specimens we have our sheets inside uh, extra protective folders this is one of our specimens from the martin herbarium so this is an, an, an enemy uh, which would have been collected in the early 18th century uh, here you can see we've got the herbarium specimen itself so this is the original plant material about three nearly 300 years old this plant um, we've got the original la labels, the collection labels, um, and then later on, other labels have been added with more information. So we have uh, the annotation of Dr. Fuchs, who's the, the individual who collected this specimen and sent it to John Martin. And then we've got um, a polynomial name, so a Latin uh, description almost, which was used to refer to this particular plant uh, that's written by John Martin and then we have Thomas Martin um, adding the Latin binomial um, so this is the system that Linnaeus popularized of having a genus name and a species epithet a two-part Latin name now John Martin assembled much of his collection before Linnaeus popularised that system and that, that system started being used consistently and it was Thomas Martin we think who added a lot of those Latin 
Linnaean binomials later on to the specimens. This specimen was one of the ones that Henslow, when he became Professor of Botany, rescued. Basically, when Henslow became the Professor of Botany in 1825, he inherited the Martin herbarium, and he found that a lot of it was in bad condition, a lot of it was pest damaged, water damaged, and a lot of the material had to be thrown away completely. He salvaged what he could and he remounted many of the specimens. And so this is a specimen where we've got a 300 year old plant, but the paper it's mounted on is Henslow's paper, which is about 200 years old. Um, and he added the labels, he transferred the labels across where he could to. This writing down in the bottom corner is Henslow's handwriting, and that's where he's gone through and he's added the up-to-date names himself as well. And above you can see a little tick and a date and some initials, and that is Peter Sell's handwriting. And Peter Sell worked here for many, many decades in the 20th century through to the early 21st century, and he annotated specimens too to update the names, to verify the identifications. Too. So this kind of specimen um, tells a lot of history and specimens do change over time. People add new information to the sheets themselves. They're, they're not preserved in aspic like one might think of for, for such historic material. Um, but yeah, they, they change and, and new information is added over time. Some of the specimens from this period um, were collected because they had particular economic uses or medicinal uses and this is one where we have a whole page of notes on the specimen about how to identify the plant, how to repair the plant and how to use it medicinally. Um, we have the plant material and then we have the label attached the original label with a common name and then a later name which has been added, a Latin name. And many specimens from this time period would have been collected with particular uses in mind. Here's another specimen uh, with economic and cultural information on the specimen or connected with the specimen. This is one of the specimens in the Haddon collection. Now the Haddon expedition of 1898 uh, to the Torres Straits Islands collected a huge amount of cultural material, material that's in the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology and in other collections, um, not in Cambridge. Uh, but the plant specimens which went with those anth more anthropological collections are here in the herbarium. And these specimens are an, another example of one of the collections, it's a discrete collection of a particular expedition which we will image and make available for research so that these specimens can be connected with all the other materials which are out there um, and the whole expedition's resources can be compared and, and brought together. So Henslow a really enriched the herbarium when he been the professor of botany. He took the Martin collection and he salvaged what he could. He updated the names, he annotated the specimens. He also added a huge number of specimens to the collection himself. So here's one of Henslow's sheets and Henslow has very distinctive specimens in many cases. And this is a nice example. This specimen shows multiple individuals of the same plant uh, collected and assembled in what, what he termed a collated sheet. So here we have a population of one particular plant with all the different size variation. We also have some others which are growing with slightly different growth habit. And he very, very neatly annotates his specimens Henslow's writing is really legible compared to many botanists of, of this sort of time period of the early 19th century to mid 19th century. Um, here you can see he's got the plant name, he's got the location, this is Gamlingay Heath, which people based in Cambridge sure will know, hopefully, and we've got the date of the collections of the two sets of plants and who collected them. Again, you can see a label from Peter Sell later on updating the names. So Henslow's specimens also includes some really beautiful artwork 
Some of it's his own artwork, some of it's artwork from other sources. This specimen is particularly lovely. This is Escalcia californica, the Californian poppy, which we have growing in the botanic garden here, and many horticulturalists would know from their own gardens. Uh, here we have an illustration that came from the publication of this species. And if I open this volume from um, 1842, you can see here is the plate. This is a hand-coloured plate in this volume. Um, and here is the description of the plant. Henslow has taken a copy of this plate, again hand-coloured, so it's hand-painted, and he has annotated it. And you can see on the illustration, he's added labels of the different parts. We also have plant material, and this is plant material that he grew in the Botanic Garden. And he's got the, the normal form, because he says that the usual state, with the mitroform calyx, which is here, which you could also see mitroform calyx in the illustration. But here he has the monstrous calyx, as he calls it. This is where the calyx is split in and growing very, very differently. And this was something that Henslow was doing a lot. Uh, he was observing nature. He was observing variations and uh, distributions and mutation, what we now know are mutations, but what he called monstrosities. Uh, also hybrids, he was very interested in hybridisation. Henslow also produced lots of teaching sheets. His teaching methods were really innovative at the time and he used illustrations a lot in his teaching, in his lectures uh, and in his um, uh, demonstrations with students. Here's one of his teaching sheets and we have many of these which have have not been made available uh, to date, um, but will be. But here we've got illustrations which have come from different journals, books, sent by correspondents from his own library. He's assembled them in these sheets for each different plant or each different plant group, and he's annotated them with all the parts. And there are records of his teaching where it's written about that, that Henslow would pass around these demonstration sheets showing all the different forms and stages of life for a particular plant. We also have some of his original artwork. Um, so here we have some watercolours of fungi, uh, which were completed by Henslow. Uh, these are all fungi which Henslow observed in the Cambridge area. Uh, we've got um, Bottisham Common, we've got uh, Gogmagogs, different areas, again, People from the Cambridge area who are familiar with this area will know these locations. Um, and these are from the um, mid-1820s, this is 1825, 1826, you can see. So another really exciting part of the herbarium, which I mentioned right at the beginning, is the Darwin Collection. The Darwin Collection is around a thousand sheets, a thousand specimens with plants attached to them many, many more plants than 1,000 sheets, because again, they're often collated sheets like this one. So here is a specimen, or several specimens collected by Charles Darwin on the voyage of the Beagle. These were collected in Patagonia, these ones, these grasses. And these are collections of a grass of what Darwin thought were the same species. Actually, now they're considered to be two separate species growing in the same place at the same time. And you can see how, in the way that Henslow collected um, and, and presented his specimens, we've got multiple instances of that same plant, or what Darwin thought was the same plant. Now it's Henslow who actually put these together on the one sheet, as a collated sheet, and this is Henslow's handwriting on the sheet, not Darwin's. Um, but these are the, the specimens that Darwin collected, and He's collected in the same way that Henslow collected. There's no real reason why he would have collected multiple specimens of the same plant from the same place at the same time, unless he was looking out for these kinds of differences. Here's another Darwin specimen, and this is a specimen from the Galapagos Islands. Here we have a fern, and this is a fern species that Darwin collected in on um, in October 1835 and you can see he's 
folded some of the leaflets over so you can see both sides. And this is there's a letter in the uh, Cambridge University Library where Henslow writes to Darwin and he, he tells him to, if, if a specimen has got different features on different sides, to fold over the tips, um, particularly if things are too big to fit on a single sheet. And there's a little diagram where he shows this, which is rather interesting. Again, Darwin was looking out for differences, unusual things, and so from the same clump of uh, this, this fern um, fronds, he also collected another sheet. So this is from the same plant, but you can see here it's growing in a very, very different way. And this is what Hensley would have described as a monstrous form. This is a mutation. Um, so this is one where instead of having these pinnate leaves that are shaped like a feather, you've got a palmate leaf with all of the leaflets coming from the same point. Again, we've got the, the folded over tips, which is quite nice. So you can see the upper and the lower surface. Now, we do find specimens in the collection, even of people like Darwin, um, that we didn't know we necessarily had. And this is a slightly different type of specimen. This is a fungus specimen, not a plant. And it was originally collected and preserved in alcohol. So we should, this is why it's in a jar. Now this specimen was at the back of a cupboard and the seal had long, long ago split and all of the alcohol had evaporated off. It was pretty filthy, um, but we had a conservator look at the specimen and clean it up and, and carefully preserve it. And they were able to basically clean up, make it look like it looks now, which is much, much clearer, including the label. And we realised that this is actually one of Darwin's specimens, again, from the Voyage of the Beagle. Um, and this is also part of the type material for this particular fungus. So this is a fungus, um, Citaria darwinii, named for Darwin, which Darwin collected in um, Tierra del Fuego. And most of the specimen, well, the rest of the specimen is at Q and uh, is part of is designated as the type specimen, but actually this is also part of that material. So this is also type material for this species. Uh, this was just found a couple of years ago here in the collection. We also have collections from some other really significant botanists in this collection. This is a specimen collected by Alfred Russell Wallace in Borneo. We have one of the, well, we have the largest botanical collection of Wallace material that survives. It's a collection of 41 fern specimens that he collected. Um, he seems to have collected them from a particular point, a particular location, population diversity survey of all this, the fern species growing in that area at that one time. There's a whole story behind these specimens, but again, they were only discovered relatively recently um, within the last decade. So you might have noticed that the specimen we just looked at, the Wallace specimen, is in one of those red folders, and that is because it's one of the type specimens. So that is the specimen that that species was named and described in the scientific literature from. This is another of the type specimens, and this is from John Lindley's herbarium. So I mentioned how Lindley particularly uh, compiled specimens of horticultural and ornamental and economic interest. This is one of Lindley's type specimens, and this is a succulent, Echeveria acutifolia. If I put it on a sheet and show it to you a little bit more closely, you can see here we have the plant material and we have the original label attached to it, which says it was collected by Hartwig uh, in Oaxaca in Mexico in 1841. And then we've got a hand-coloured illustration Again, here on the sheet. If we go to the original literature, so this is um, the volume in 1842, published by John Lindley, we can see the original description of this species, and you can see that same plate attached. And this description talks about Mr. Hartwig collecting this in Oaxaca, Mexico, um, in the 1840s, sending the plant material back to England. So that specimen was in a red folder. That has been identified as being a type specimen previously. 
And so it's been pulled out, it's been put into that, curated into that red edged folder. And this is a specimen which had not previously been identified as being a type specimen. This was found in the collection by some students a couple of years ago. They started going through the Lindy collection and pulling out all the specimens where there was artwork on the specimen on the basis that if someone had bothered to add an illustration, it slightly increased the chance that that was possibly a type specimen or of particular interest. This was one of the ones that they found, and I think this is particularly beautiful. This is a relative of hydrangea. Um, it's now known as dichroa, um, but it was named Adamia versicolor when it was first described. We've got this beautiful piece of artwork Half, it's not finished, it's, it's half completed. You can see the line drawing, you can see the, the painting itself. And there's very, very little information on this specimen. It says HHS, um, September 1846. HHS is Herbarium of the Horticultural Society. That's what became the Royal Horticultural Society. There's also a name. Again, this is Lin, John Lindley's handwriting. If we look up the original publication information for Adamia versicolor, we find the original publication and it talks about a plant being collected in Hong Kong by Robert Fortune. It describes this plant, it describes this inflorescence and there's a plate which is the finished plate of this illustration. It describes how this plant was collected and it was sent back to the Horticultural Society of London and it flowered in the collection of the Horticultural Society in September 1846. So this is the type specimen of that species. And you can see how rich this collection is. This is a rhododendron from Borneo. This is a very beautiful specimen with multiple sheets. And you can see the flowers, the leaves, and then there's several original illustrations attached to these as well. We have the red form and we've got the yellow form as well. And this is the part, part of the, the type material for this species. And just to show you the last few specimens from the Lindy collection, just because they are so interesting um, and so beautiful. Uh, here's an iris, iris imbricata. This is from the Caucasus Mountains. Um, here again, you've got some hand coloured artwork. You've also got a little extra illustration. This is a Lindley illustration. He's, he's done a little bit of dissection of the, the central part of the flower. Um, and the label from the garden of the Horticultural Society, what became the RHS. So this was, this was flowered in the garden in 1845 and this is the type of specimen for this species. And here is a lovely Nepenthes specimen. This is Nepenthes albo marginata. Um, this was collected by Thomas Lobb in Penang. Um, here you can see the, the picture of the plant. So this is one of the carnivorous plants. So this is the leaf and the leaf extends into the structure which has digestive juices inside and insects and all sorts of pollen and, and the plant digests them. You can see the mottling on the outside of the picture, which is quite distinctive of the species. It's a very beautiful one. Um, so this is the type specimen, part of the type material for this species. And again, we have another previously undesignated type, which was found in the collection. This one is not in such nice condition. Um, this has become very soot damaged for various reasons. Um, and the Lindley collection contains quite a lot of material which is in this bad condition. This needs proper conservation work to preserve it. But here you can see these enormous pictures and this is part of the type material for Nepenthes vicii. We've got the original label um, from Thomas Lobb with the location and the altitude that it's collected in the, in the blue label. And then we've got a label added um, saying it was collected by Thomas Lobb in Borneo and uh, it was sent back to uh, Veach and some horticulturalists and Veach sent material to Lindley to get the new species described essentially and this is Lindley's handwriting Borneo Lobb 
tea lob and, and this is the specimen. And here you can see the gold um, peristome structure around the, the edge of the pitcher. I think this is a really beautiful specimen but it, it needs some conservation work to, to preserve it. So that's a little overview of some of the historic specimens in particular in our collection. There's a lot more I could show you. I could show you a lot more from the 20th century. I've really concentrated on more our historical collections to start with and some of the priority specimens which we will be making available for the public and for researchers online soon.